So we're glad that there is community interest in having dialogue regarding this subject. Um, as you can see, this is a regional vehicle, and I'd like to spend a moment to introduce our public safety partners that are partners with us, not only in the county, but partners with us on this proposal. Um, we are partnering with Alameda County Fire, and we have our Alameda County Fire Chief, Dave Rocha, here tonight. We also partnered with Fremont Police Department and Fremont Fire Department tonight from the Fremont Police Department. We have, um, sorry, Kim Peterson to the left of the fire chief. And to the left of her, we have um, Fremont Fire Department Captain Gary Ashley with us as well. Also at the front of the table is Captain Ed Tracy from the San Leandro Police Department. And I'd like to present our presenter tonight, who is um, an expert in this topic in the San Leandro Police Department, Lieutenant Rain Brand. Can everyone hear me before I get started here? Good. Again, these are the partners in a grant, and this is way beyond this group of four. This is a regional asset. So these are the groups that actually have been trusted if the grant goes through to house this vehicle and maintain it. But it's really beyond this group. It's really a regional asset. There's nothing like it in Northern California, uh, a medevac, and I'll get more into that here in a second. I'd like to re review the 2014-15 Council goals is to place the San Leandro on a firm foundation for long-term fiscal sustainability, advanced projects and programs promoting sustainable economic development, including transforming San Leandro into a career center for innovation. Provide quality public safety service and grow our partnership with the community to keep San Leandro safe. And I believe this vehicle is in line with that goal. Maintain and enhance San Leandro's infrastructure, support and implement programs, activities, Strength of communication and enhances the quality of life and wellness, celebrates the arts and diversity, and promotes civic pride. Maintain and support strong positive relationship between the city, schools, and the educational community. The, the goal of the project, going to obtain a rescue vehicle, provide public safety in the area, and again, it's much beyond the four partners in this, our region with the vehicle to maintain the safety. And that's the purpose of it is to medical rescue and high risk operations. <coughs> Project history, the funding about probably about a year ago, Fremont Police Department, who works a lot with Fremont Fire Department, approached us about some grant funding. They wanted to go in as a regional asset knowing we had no ballistic protection in the city of San Leandro. We have borrowed such vehicles from them, like the picture on the right, some of you will remember, that was a Pep Boys shooting where, where there was a shot fired for an armed robbery here on East 14th. We went ahead and applied for the paperwork, uh, submitted the proposal. Based on all the information in the proposal, they thought definitely there was a need in the area. A lot of it had to do with our geographic location. We're in between 580, 880, Oakland Airport. A lot of major infrastructure in our area that could benefit from such vehicle. Vehicle comparisons. I think it's really important to really lead off with this because what are we talking about? I've been really watching you know, nationwide what's been going on as far as some of the discussions of similar vehicles in the media. So I thought it's really important before I really lead into us that all of you know what we're talking about. The vehicle on the left, much like the one outside, that's a Medivac. It's made by a Lemco company. Uh, that's actually a Los Angeles Sheriff's Office working on that with paramedics from their region. Those are the closest vehicles we have which is again, Southern California, they share five of these vehicles from that department. Vehicle on the right is an MRAP. People are pretty, I guess, familiar with that based on the 1033 program. And what that means is a lot of cities will get refurbished military equipment for zero or no dollars, fabricate it for their needs, and then put them into their fleet 
And potentially this could be based on their fiscal situations or their grant funding. The vehicle, again, we're going to discuss tonight is a vehicle on the left. It's a Medivac. It's a 2015 Leco Medivac. It's the only type of vehicle. Uh, one manufacturer really making it. They're a sole source provider. It's really the industry standard. About a thousand hours annually to maintain. It's an F554 drivetrain and it drives just like a pickup truck. I've driven this truck and believe me, it doesn't take a, a whole lot of training to learn how to drive this. I can teach pretty much anyone in this room how to drive it. Tactics have changed. Really approximately two guns per week are recovered by our staff, and this is just San Landro. About 107 guns annually, about 430 guns in the past four years. Just this week we recovered three handguns during two different traffic stops. One of those traffic stops, a teenager had a gun in his waistband in the backseat of a car. We're familiar with these vehicles and where they're used nationally. Every day on the news, if you see a critical incident, you're going to see similar vehicles. Most of you are familiar with a Bearcat. A Bearcat is made by the same manufacturer, but it is not like an ambulance setup as the one that's outside. So if you look at the incidents that we're familiar with up top, one, the Boston Marathon bombing. If you remember, when they did the yard to yard searches, they had vehicles used like this to transport people in and out of the scene and provide them protection until they found a suspect in a boat. Santa Barbara incident, they were used down there. The Stockton robbery this past July, that vehicle was involved in that incident. Again, this is a Bearcat. During that incident, their vehicle was struck along with 10 or 11 patrol cars. Just for an example, the suspect in that incident used an AK-47 rifle. The vest I'm wearing, the car I drive on a nipple, typical patrol shift will not withstand those rounds. This vehicle was struck during that incident and speaking with people that were directly involved in that incident said if it wasn't for that vehicle, it would have potentially been drawn out and they would have never been able to approach the vehicle that they were dealing with. Sacramento incidents. Just a couple months ago, I think we're all familiar with that. Placer County deputy was killed and murdered along with the deputy from Sacramento County. They use these similar vehicles also in those incidents. Justifications and advantages. Recommended by a SWAT, SWAT audit. What does that mean? In 2012, our chief brought in subject matter experts to evaluate our SWAT team's practices. They looked at the way we train, the equipment we have, and really to make sure we're doing things safe is we understand SWAT is a high liability area. Those subject matter experts identify based on the feedback and their evaluation of our practices that this type of vehicle was in need. That was more towards a Bearcat approach, but again, we're talking about a Medivac tonight. It allows public safety to get closer to a problem. What we mean by that is TEMS there, Tactical Emergency Medicine, which our fire partners here represent, along with a lot of our staff who would have advanced training in first aid measures, Hostage negotiators, which are trained to talk, speak with people and evaluate what's going on and use their skills to really use the minimum force necessary to really try to get compliance out of whatever we're dealing with. Less lethal measures can get closer to a problem. Most of our less lethal tools, if you're not aware of them, go out to about 60 meters. My taser on my hip, under 25 feet. So we need to get all our tools and all our resources closer to a potential problem and use as many tools as possible before it results in lethal force. Also, pre-planned incidents, whether it be SWAT operations, uh, SWAT has changed drastically in the years that I've been exposed to SWAT operations. Now what we like to do is contain incidents, bring all the tools close to the problem, and resolve them peacefully, and bring the suspect or the people out to us, and really we, we try to get established voluntary compliance from our suspects. Rescue benefits. A lot of you are going to remember 2005, Officer Mimi from our agency was murdered. He was murdered down the street at Doolittle, down on the south end of town, very quiet residential neighborhood. Alameda County Fire responded to that scene. When you hear those types of calls come in, every resource in the city will respond that way. Alameda County Fire responded. Not only did they get there and did what really was against what was the norm at that time, but they put their staff in a threat's way while an armed gunman was going yard to yard fleeing from our staff. Unfortunately, Officer Nimi wasn't saved in that incident, but I think this vehicle would potentially made an impact in a rescue. Whether or not he would have made it, we'll never know. But this vehicle would have got there, 
The paramedics would have been protected. We could have brought him into that vehicle and either brought him to a staging area, deemed safe, or straight to the hospital. Again, this is an ambulance with armor on it. 2009, people are familiar with that incident. 321 in Oakland. Four officers were murdered, two on MacArthur, two right around the corner, all by the same gunman. During the scene being processed, during people doing first aid, it was still a threat area. We did not know where the, the gunman was. When I say we, public safety. They eventually located the suspect. Two more officers went down. They used their vehicle, again, it's a Bearcat, not a Medivac, to transport one of those officers up to Highland Hospital. Unfortunately, he didn't make it either, but what they did there is use a tactical Bearcat to really do a Medivac, Medivac's responsibility. If that incident happened today, they would use both vehicles and use one to do the transport, the medical application, and use the other to stay at the incident. 2012, everyone's familiar with the Okios incident. Major campus shooting, lots of people died in that situation. Unfortunately, these vehicles were used in that, but not a medivac. If the more resources that are available, the faster we can transport people out of a critical area where the threat is still there. Shortly after, the suspect was apprehended in Alameda. San Leonardo Marina incident. If you're not aware of this, we did do a press release on it. I happened to be working at desk uh, when we released it. And what happened is, a suspect out at the marina, probably our most visited park in town, was manipulating what was described as a gun out at the shoreline. Lots of residents in that area, officers responded, and again, they know what type of equipment we have and what could potentially face this potential threat. My vest, my vehicle may not protect me from that, okay? Not knowing exactly what the, what the weapon was. Not only did they get on scene, they immediately called for an armored vehicle because they thought it dictated that. Hayward Police Department responded, which is rare with staffing to bring a vehicle to us. 880, perfect situation, northbound, 20 minutes they arrive. We put all the things that I told you earlier, hostage negotiator, someone trained in crisis intervention, dealing with people that are mentally ill, less lethal measures, along with a driver and another person from Hayward Police Department. They got up close to the incident, in opposed to staying hundreds of yards away, where they know they wouldn't get struck by the potential weapon. They initially started negotiating with the suspect. They did have to use less legal means to overcome his resistance. He was taken into custody or detained and put on a psychiatric hold. Not only was our staff saved at that moment, his life was saved, and little did we know it was an airsoft or a simulated BB gun type weapon. At a distance, we don't know that, so potentially he would have died with lethal force if we would have hesitated at a distance and then see what it was and acquire what it was. Instead, we could get close enough to acquire what it was and just give us a little extra time. Rescue incidents. The past two years, people say, how, how often do you use these vehicles? We've used nine vehicles in the past two years. Six of these vehicles were pre-planned incidents. And what does that mean? That means two, three days prior, I could call that agency and say, hey, on Thursday, can we borrow this vehicle because we have a planned operation going? The three vehicles that we actually had to borrow during critical incidents, that marina incident, one of them, a year prior to this outline. It's very important to know that minutes can make the difference between saving lives in those incidents. And pre-planned is really on our side, but when we have to actively request vehicles, the delay could potentially cost ourselves, public safety members' lives, or even community members. One thing I would really like to outline is I hear, why don't you just borrow one of the many vehicles or assets within Alameda County? Again, these are tactical vehicles. These aren't medevac vehicles that we're discussing tonight but I think it's applicable. That bottom one there, that's Fairfield Police Department. Okay, the night before a major warrant service involving violent gangs, over 20 agencies involved, our planning, our, our SWAT leadership on our team, put a lot of work into some plans. And then right before, the night before the operation, we were told the agency we were gonna borrow the vehicle from needed a second vehicle at their incident. So now we're in a dilemma. Do we jeopardize the tactics and safety of the members of our team and our safety and community members, or do we kind of think of another option? So we did, we do a lot of regional training. Annually we trained with Fairfield Police Department. I made a phone call to their agency. Sure enough, two hours prior to the operation, at two or three in the morning from two counties away, two operators from their agency drove that vehicle down, which ultimately ended up with a successful outcome and no force use, again, with some of the tactics previously described. This incident, Saskatoon, Canada. A lot of people are going to think, what does Saskatoon, Canada have to do with San Leandro? Picture this residential residence being one of our houses in our community. 
Put them up a lot of similarities between the two cities. 2004, they lost an officer. 2012, they acquired a vehicle. Not only did they acquire that vehicle, they had a lot of community concern. Was this type of vehicle needed in the city of Saskatoon? 2014, this past August, they did a rescue where potentially this vehicle saved lives. Not only potentially, it did save lives. I'm about to show you a video and I'll provide you some narrative what we're watching. The man on the right is Sergeant Ken Kane. He's a patrol sergeant. Our patrol sergeant, very similar, is we have our SWAT team on duty really at any given time, not full time in the SWAT operation, but they will use their training and their tactics to help out the rest of the patrol staff to make their community safer. Same thing with Sergeant Ken Kane here, who is a patrol sergeant with SWAT experience. He overhears the, the call coming in, heard the need for potentially an armored vehicle to be used. They have a Bearcat. Again, it's a medivac. It's not a medivac, but what we're describing now, but it was used to be a medivac. If they had a Bearcat and a medivac, they would use a Bearcat for tactics and did this with the medivac that's outside. Four residents were trapped. What happened is that suspects upstairs in a, in a window, shooting out, at a, out the window at his sister pinned behind a car you're going to see on the video. During this time, a four-year-old and eight-year-old that belongs to the lady that's behind the car are in the residence along with her elderly dad who is disabled and not able to move, maneuver around the house. A neighbor actually went in, physically got all those people out of that residence. They're all trapped behind a vehicle as we lead in this video. And just so you know, this video played awesome about an hour ago. <laughs> so I did try this equipment right. Okay, so he's asking for the bear cat. We're looking at the residents. We're seeing the pickup truck here. Again, there's a four year old, eight year old, elderly dad, sister, and a landlord getting behind his vehicle and rifle fire. That rifle fire will go through any of the patrol cars any of the vests that our typical patrol officers wear. Bearcat, again, not many back, ballistic rated to protect all staff and community from the weapon that's being used. Shots fired. This is a patrol response. Okay, this isn't a SWAT team. This little blob behind the pickup truck, that's people hiding behind the engine block. Performing a rescue in a protected environment. The rescue hatch is up, providing cover. Shots fired, vehicle is getting hit. One hits the rescue hatch during this rescue. Patrol officers are going to step away from this protection that they have to step out and help the last couple of people get into the vehicle. successfully rescued, not a shot fired by the police personnel, and actually uh, he, was, he voluntarily came out and he was arrested. 
This is a quick little video. Speaking with the team leaders on both of them, they think the outcome would have been much different without this type of protection. This particular sergeant that's interviewed on here, they use less lethal measures from that top hatch to actually fire at a subject with a rifle and use less lethal means to overcome his resistance when legitimately they probably could have ended his life that day. bars tonight after shooting at officers during a five-hour standoff yesterday. The Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office credits a new armored truck, you see it right there, for this this uh, safe, this standoff ending safely. I'm News News Five's Linda Morris is live now, and Linda, those trucks definitely saved those deputies. They did, Darielle, and Freddie is the man who shot at Sheriff's deputies. He is in the Oklahoma County Jail tonight. That's and uh, Sheriff said he said that he's lucky to be there because without that armored truck, he could have been killed. Want to commit suicide by cop? But sheriff's deputies say they weren't going to let that happen. It started when sheriff's deputies were called to the house for a possible domestic violence situation. When the deputies got here, he sat on the porch uh, with both a rifle and a shotgun. Uh, every time the deputy would try to make an approach, he would. Um, wave the gun or aim the gun at the deputy. Deputies then decided to protect themselves. There were about uh, seven or eight rounds fired at our deputies. Our deputies at that time were in uh, the Bearcat. The Bearcat is an armored vehicle sheriff's deputies used to approach the shooter. 50-year-old Freddie Shatwell. They say that Bearcat is what saved his life and theirs. We would have had to approach him at some point. And if he had acted the same way, if we had been approaching without an armored vehicle, we would have definitely had to use lethal force against him. Or he stayed there, or himself, or anyone else who lives nearby. Reporting live on Linda Mott is Eyewitness News 5. Linda. As far as areas that can benefit from our community, you can name really any, whether it be a residential area, a commercial district, just to name a couple, City Hall, Schools, Bayfair Center, Kaiser Campus, Marina Square, Marina Park. If you could think of an ap application or a destination for an active shooter or a violent subject, you could think of an application for a similar vehicle. <laughs> Grant funding, where are we at right now? Uh, so far we've been told that we could get up to 200000 in a shish cap grant. What does that mean for the remainder? The remaining costs would be brought up between the partners and from our piece would be asset forfeiture, not from our typical city funds. Something to keep in mind, and I entered the grant process, People didn't really have a lot of confidence because a lot of these vehicles are turned down, but there is not this type of vehicle in our area, and they saw there was a need in Northern California. Next steps, if this goes through, council consideration in February. It's not going to be February 2nd, so stay tuned from our council for notification on that. We'll also advertise that. If approved, we purchase a vehicle, incorporate vehicle in policy. What that means is a lot of people are concerned when we deploy this type of vehicle, that would all be outlined in the policy and incidents throughout the nation where people question this type of vehicle use, we would definitely address within our policy. Staff training, we make sure everyone knows how to drive it. A lot of our staff are already kind of subject matter experts because again, we borrow these vehicles all the time. Grant partner training, our partners up here, not only our group up here, but we really make sure all throughout our area that people know how to drive this vehicle, know the assets available, because it's not just our communities on a panel, it's really the region in general. Estimated delivery time really is a year. I've heard these vehicles get produced in six months. It just depends on when the order goes in and what kind of specifications we outline. In closing, San Leonardo Police Department is committed to providing community and staff state-of-the-art equipment consistent with best practices to enhance public safety, protect the community, and public safety assets. In closing, I'd like to open it to our other partners to see if they have anything they'd like to add to this presentation. And I really appreciate you listening to what we have to offer and the subject at hand. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Dave Roach. I'm the Fire Chief for the Alameda County Fire Department. Uh, and, and I think a question that keeps coming up is why is the Fire Department uh, 
apartments. And, and, and I think from a historic standpoint, but we're very simply, society has changed. And um, when I started the fire service 25 years ago, um, and we had active shooter incidents, or we had riots, or protests, or those sorts of things, the fire department was always told, you're riding on the red engine, you're wearing the yellow jacket, do those sorts of things. And that's the level of protection. But society's changed around us, and that's not appropriate. Um, I don't want to be in any position that I'm asking my firefighters to put a yellow jacket on or ride on a red fire engine and expect that to be the level of protection that they go in one of these instances. There's been too many of them. It doesn't, you know, the, the folks, if, if you talk about Columbine, Aurora, Colorado, Wacos, or Sandy Hook, the folks never thought it was going to happen then. But those are all incidents that occurred where firefighters were asked to respond and go in and do, do the activities that we do best and do advanced life support with, with the police officers. And you need this sort of vehicle to move in in a timely manner to provide advanced life support. So um, from the Alameda County Fire Department standpoint, this is going to be a great regional asset. We protect five cities and all of the unincorporated area. But when we talk about region, one of the things to be to understand is the region is actually, when it comes to mutual aid, and this, this will be an asset that's in the mutual aid system, runs all the way from Monterey County to Del Norte County up on the north. It's a large region. This will be the only unit of its type. And that's the reason why it came to the top of the list for SHISHCAP to be funded. So um, we fully support it and, uh, and look forward to uh, it being deployed, and especially being deployed here in the Alameda County area because time is really of the essence when you get into an active shooter and Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kimberly Peterson and I'm a captain for the Fremont Police Department and we are the uh, primary partner in this endeavor. Uh, just very quickly about my background, um, I was a member of our SWAT team for seven years as an operator and then later as a team leader and then I helped develop our tactical medic program so I have a, a total of about 11 years of SWAT experience. I know that when you look at me the first thing you think of is not SWAT but I, I give you that background uh, just to provide some context for my own comments. Um, the reason why we are so interested in, in this asset it, from, a, from a SWAT perspective is that uh, our tactical medic team is very unique. Um, our tactical medic team is made up of uh, paramedics and EMTs and we uh, deploy them on every SWAT incident. And we already have an armored rescue vehicle, but what we don't have is the capability to deploy our medics um, separately from our tactical team uh, safely. We, we use our Bearcat to uh, move our tactical team up close and personal to, to whatever the problem is. But we either have to uh, bring our medics into that Bearcat with them, in which case they can't separate because it's, it's not safe to move around without being inside the Bearcat, uh, or we have to put them in vehicles. And if we put them in regular vehicles, we have to stage them uh, in a safer area, which means they're not as close, they're not available to, to victims. Uh, so we have a real interest in being able to, to use this MedCat to, uh, which will be you know, specifically designed for medical service so that we can deploy our medics in that vehicle and provide some versatility in terms of moving around and being able to move to wherever the injured party is and then be able to rescue that person back to better medical care away from the incident without moving the tactical. But as a patrol commander, uh, the thing that keeps me up at night is the active shooter, you know, the school shootings in particular. And uh, I just very quickly looked up some stats uh, before I came in here, and the FBI stats show that active shooter incidents are happening at a rate of about uh, 11 and a half per year. So this is not just some anecdotal thing. It is happening, and it's happening all over this country right now. And let me tell you that um, SWAT teams are not the teams that handle active shooter incidents, at least not in communities like ours. SWAT teams aren't full-time teams in communities like ours. Both San Leandro and, and Fremont have tactical teams that are where it's collateral duties. So if you call SWAT because there's an active shooter incident happening in Fremont, it takes about an hour to get a full team there. We might have a handful there um, you know, on scene because they happen to be working. But I would imagine for San Leandro it's very similar. You know, an hour of response time is pretty typical when you do uh, an unanticipated SWAT call out. So what that means is whoever's on duty is handling it. Whoever's working for the fire department, whoever's working for the, for the EMS, uh, the ambulance company, that's who's coming to save your children. Okay, and without an asset like this, what it means is we're sending our people in 
uh, unprotected, and then they have to carry people out individually. So how many, you know, people can you drag out to medical care? Because I'm telling you that EMS doesn't go into those hot zones. They don't go into the danger area until it's been cleared. And that can literally be hours. So if you want the ability to get people in there safely, I mean, your first responders, whether it's police, fire, EMS, or all three at once, then you need something like this. And you need access to it right now. You need access to it, you know, immediately. You can't stand uh, there and let people move to that. Uh, people, the, the most common survivable injury uh, did from a gunshot wounds or explosives is, is bleeding to death, about 66%. So you need immediate medical care. And without an asset like this, so bring your first responders into those danger zones, uh, you're going to <coughs> Um, you know, as a mother of three children myself, um, I want my first responders in the community where I live to have this kind of ability to get in there, grab the injured parties, get them out to primary medical care right now. So I think that that's uh, why this would be an incredibly important tool for your community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gary Ashley. I'm the uh, tactical paramedic for uh, Fremont SWAT uh, TENS unit. I'm also a uh, paramedic captain for the uh, fire department. Um, what this vehicle will allow us to do is get to the injured parties quickly, and I hate to use the cliche like seconds count or golden hour, but this is a game changer because care can be rendered quickly and safely. And once my team is on scene and that door closes in that vehicle, I don't have to worry about what's going on outside. I can focus on the patient. And uh, that's what this vehicle allows us to do. And, and I'm fortunate um, to really work both sides, police and fire. And um, really, there's not a lot separating us. The mission is the same, and the mission is to save lives. So thank you for your consideration. Mayor, that concludes uh, our presentations. We turn it over to you. Any comments?